I do believe <clears throat> that it must be 10 years that I have been giving the share. And every year I come here and I'm still um, filled, first of all, with the, with the awe of the tragedy that happened all the way back that began this minhag when we remember Yai Netzer ben Avram Vitzipora. And um, we are dedicating this as well for Netzer ben Avram Vesara and Banafshe Juliet ben David Nasi ben Nasi ben Nasi ben Nasi. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the Eshet Avram organization for being consistent and so devoted in sponsoring me and giving me this tremendous merit to support and to be able to spread Torah in this beautiful community. And once again, I would like to thank Chazak for everything they do for being one of the premier organizations for disseminating Torah throughout the whole world. What can I tell you? I chose a subject that this year is the year that my father passed away, and it made me think about the subject of tears and to study the concept of tears on a whole new, different level, which I'm going to explain tonight. We're going to learn together this extraordinary parsha, this extraordinary subject of why Hashem created this phenomena called tearing. <clears throat> For me personally, one of my first memories of tearing is an incident that happened to me in my high school in London. I teach in the Hasmonean, excuse me, I, I actually taught there as well. But I went to a high school called Hasmonean in Northwest London. And something crazy happened. What happens? One of my friends, his name was Ellis. I'm not going to say his second name because I do believe he now lives in New York. But Ellis did not like his French classes. He actually hated them. We all actually hated them, but he decided to do something about it. And when a big French test came along, he decided enough was enough. <clears throat> and this was the 70s in London. And he called a, from a phone booth. Now, I just have to go slowly over here, because I see there are people here who are under 50. And they may not know what I mean by a phone booth. They probably think I'm making a Spider-Man reference. Uh, but actually, once upon a time, somewhere between the Civil War and Vietnam, uh, people used to communicate by going to these booths and picking up a phone and used to dial and put in money. It's a concept. I don't want to complicate things this evening. We're aware of the phones today. The what? We're aware of those phones, public phones. You are? Yeah, we all are aware. OK. They have them in the subways. Oh, well, I forgot this is Queens. OK. <laughs> Yeah, so my point is, is that he went to a phone booth and he called the police and he put on his finest Irish accent and he said, I'd like to report there's going to be a bombing in the Hasmonean in high school. And he put the phone down and within minutes the police came down and I had these memories of my rebbeim rushing to take out the Sifrei Torah and, 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 and the whole school was evacuated and it was this whole complicated thing, but yeah, the French test was actually canceled. This was incredible. <laughs> the problem was, is that what came afterwards was a police investigation. And there was a memory that I have, I was maybe 16 years old, of speaking to a British police officer who was clearly investigating something that he thought was very serious. But the problem was, is that I was just a little 16 year old and I was looking straight into his belly button. He was this huge guy. And he comes along and he says, hello, 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 young man. And he starts to ask me questions. And I started to have the giggles. <laughs> now, I'm very ticklish. And I'm also one of those people that once you get me giggling, it's very hard to make me stop. And here I am. The more I realized that this was an important conversation, the more I started laughing until eventually I crumpled down and I was just crying with tears of laughter. And the policeman did not know what to do with me. He basically gave up on me as some kind of like, Senor el loco. And that was it. But this has happened to me on many, many occasions. When something really serious is about to happen and I start to get the giggles, I have no idea what to do. I, I'll bite my lip until I bleed. Crazy things. I even recall this summer, 
excuse me, it was straight after Pesach. I was coming home with my family from Miami, Florida. We just were there on the Pesach program. And the plane took us through Warsaw. We left the airport for one day. I showed my family Warsaw. But I told them, I said, you know, when you go through Polish security, we have to be very serious. These people have no sense of humor. They're Poles. You've got to be very, very, very serious looking, answer their questions. And we come in, and uh, there's the men's, and there's the women's, and there's my wife, and my two daughters, and then my little baby daughter. And I'm going last. And my wife is confronting the Polish security officer. She's a female. You wouldn't know it. I mean, so this huge, big woman, like a reject from the Polish wrestling team, super heavyweight size. And uh, she's demanding that my wife uh, takes off her tichel. She wants to see if she's carrying a bomb underneath her tichel. My wife is saying she's not doing it. It's a whole big deal. Then afterwards, she's patting down my wife. And then she's patting down my, my one daughter and then another daughter. And then comes my little lula bears. My Layla is nine years old. She's the cutest little thing. Looking at the audience, some of you may actually know her. And this cute little girly as is being, she's facing me and she's being patted down by this massive woman and I'm looking at the terror on her eyes. And this is the funniest thing ever because for goodness sake, what on earth is she looking for on this little girl? What do you think she's carrying? And then I go in. And this guy, the male one, he starts to like, and I start, he's tickling me, all right? The guy's like going like this, and he's going like this. And I can't take this anymore. And I basically run out of there, and I collapse in a heap. And I'm crying, and I'm crying, and I'm crying. And, and that's it. I was completely dysfunctional. You couldn't do anything with me. But the point is, is that, yeah, there are people in this room, I'm sure you've experienced this thing where you cry so much from tears of laughter that you can no longer function properly. But we, as Torah Jews, have the right to ask the question, why did Hashem create such a phenomena? Why is it that we go through emotions called tears of laughter that create this inner inability to function and of course, you have the extreme opposite, that when a person goes through a tragedy, and sometimes we just cry, and we cry, and we cry, and we are equally dysfunctional. Well, let me ask the question the way the Maharal asked the question. Maharal in Prague consistently asks, what can we learn from every physical phenomena that we see Hashem created? Nothing is by chance. He will explain, he'll go through the human body from top to bottom, and ask, why is the nose here? Why are the ears over here? Why is the organ of balance placed into the ears? Why is the Kashbar who put the heart a little bit to the left side? Every small little detail in the human body, he will try and explain to mine it for deeper meaning. And clearly, the concept of tearing is something that is, it begs the Maral to ask, what is this? A person is emotional. A person's emotional either through tears of sadness or through tears of joy. And a Baruch Hu made it with his infinite wisdom that our eyes well with tears. Why does it have to be that way? To show that we're upset? There's many ways that God can show that we're upset. He could put, I don't know, a buzzer on our forehead. And everyone would say, anything could happen. Or if not a buzzer, then, then it's just maybe, I don't know, our foreheads could turn red. Or if you insist that we have to tear, why do we have to tear outside of our eyes? Because Baruch Hu gave us big noses. We're Jews. We're proud of it. And we already have two nostrils. Put a third one right here. And that way you don't have to, you know, ladies, you don't have to ruin your makeup. You know what I mean? Think about it. You'd have a tearing duct right over here, and it would dribble off. If we all had it, you get used to it, life would be good. So what does it mean, number one, that a Kashbar who created this phenomena called tearing? What does it mean that tearing has to be liquid that comes out of the eyes? And thirdly and finally, why is it that at that moment when we cry, whether it's tears of joy or tears of sadness, we become dysfunctional? First of all, you cannot see properly. You cannot see if your eyes are filled with tears, it's dangerous to drive. And secondly, 
when you really, really cry a lot, it's sometimes you can't speak properly. Nothing can come out of your mouth. You basically close up as a functional, communicating human being. Today, we're not going to discuss this, but I can give the equal and opposite class talking about laughter. Laughter and tears, a yin and yang. They also, when you laugh a lot, so tears can come out of your eyes, and once again, you can't function properly out of your mouth. But to understand exactly the connection between tears and laughter, we will not do today. This something belongs more to a Purim class. But the bottom line is, today I want to focus and understand what does it mean? What's going on over here? Hashem created this phenomenon called tearing. Only humans cry. Animals do not cry, except for crocodiles. And those are crocodile tears. Get it? They're not real tears. A crocodile does not cry when watching when Bambi's mother died. You know what I mean? It doesn't do or whatever have to be a 21st century. I don't even know when, when, uh, when Brie died. I don't even know. Um, I don't even know from whatever it is. When Dobby died. OK, I'm looking at my <laughs> Harry Potter people out there. Um, the point I'm trying to make is, we cry, we get emotional. Why did Akash Baruch Hu make such a thing happen? So I want to begin. The Gemara in Shabbos, Kuftan Aleph Hamad Beis, brings down a cryptic Gemara and says there are six types of tears. Three are good and three are bad. What are the good tears? The good tears are number one, quote, some refua. That means that there are certain um, I imagine it was the ancient equivalent of Vic ra vapor rob. You know those things you put, whatever it is, some kind of a chemical that clears out your sinuses and makes you, little, makes you cry. Um, that's healthy. <clears throat> Another one is tears of laughter, the schok. And the third one is what the Gemara calls Paris Yothos, good fruit. Rashi says chardal, which is mustard. So I don't know, I have my Sephardic brothers and sisters in the room, so you will know more about how these things are done. Uh, with us pale faces, um, it's basically onions that make us cry. Um, that's it. What else is there? What else makes you? Oh, Mara. Mara makes you cry. But I'm sure there's these things, that are, these things that you have a good meal, and you're enjoying it, and it brings tears to the eyes. Then you have a listing of three things that are the bad tears. One is Ashan. So if God forbid, there is a fire, and you take smoke inhalation, and it causes tearing. So that is very, very dangerous. The second is what we call regular crying. Rashi says, from tsar and from avelus, from 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 suffering. And the third is called beta kise, from bathroom. Which, I, thank God, I'm not British. So because this is, you know, the British love toilet jokes, uh, but. This is the Gemara. The Gemara comes along and says there's a phenomenon called base hakise that this causes, this causes the, um, the eyes to tear. The bottom line is there's clearly a deeper thing going on over here. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to notice that this group of three begins with something uh, spiritual, like comes from like a gas, and then something emotional, and then finally something down to earth and very physical. You see over here what's called the higher from the moach, from the heart, from the emotion of the lave, and then finally something from the physical. Each one has a representation both on the side of tov and in the side of ra, dafka in the world of tears. So there's got to be something deep going on that the Gemara is not teaching us something that you can learn in a biology class, in the human biology class. There's something as a message for us to understand about the nature of tears. So, I want to take this on a very, very deep level. Today's class will be a little bit sophisticated. There's no question that everyone in this room will understand this, each one of us to our own ability on a sophisticated level. But uh, I do want to just point out that, um, that there are ladies in this room. So, and there are men. And the Talmud in Bab Metzia Nuntet Amad Aleph brings down the following words, and I quote, Le'olam yeh adam zahir ba'onas ishto, shemitoch shedimasa metzuya 
Ainasa Kreva. The Gemara seems to be giving just like basic advice in how to run a good marriage. And says the following thing. Everyone here knows there's a Torah prohibition from saying hurtful words. It's something we, we, we forget. Unfortunately, we all forget. This is something we all do. Unfortunately, unfortunately we all do this to our loved ones. Um, whenever I give parenting classes, I always tell parents before Yom Kippur, you go to each child and say, if I ever said something hurtful to you during the year, and it wasn't for good educational reasons, could be Friday afternoon, there's pressure, and you say to a kid, you're stupid, or something like that, and afterwards you realize that those words were hurtful and painful to the child, so you have to ask them for forgiveness. It's a Torah prohibition called Onat Dvarim, hurting people with the power of your mouth. Says the Talmud, a husband has to be extra sensitive for his wife because men work differently. Guys can, we can tease each other and, 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 and say nasty things and 10 seconds later everyone's forgotten what happened. This is the nature. Guys fight and they don't even remember what they fought with. Ladies can remember something that was said to her in fifth grade some passing comment and it's 20 years later and you see that girl and it's still painful and you're waiting for that moment of revenge. So you're wired up differently. So you get married, your husbands have to know that you're a little more sensitive and that you're a little bit more, um, um, uh, uh, your, your, your things hurt you with the mouth much quicker. And therefore, the Torah says, warning to the gentleman, you get married, you got to be more careful because since she's quick to tears, so you've got to be more careful with what comes out of your mouth. Why am I telling you this? Not to give us Musar, although it doesn't hurt to give us Musar. The point is, is that the Talmud identifies that women are close to tears. Why is this important? It's important for our class for a very practical reason. Because there's another Gemara that tells us the following thing, and this is important for everyone. This is the Gemara in Brachas, Lamad Beis Lamad Beis. Va'ami Rabbi Eleza, miyoyim shechara beis hamigdash, ninalu shari tvila. The gates of prayer have been closed since the temple has been destroyed. Va'af al pisha shari tvila ninalu shari dimalo ninalu. Even though the gates of prayer has been closed, the gates of tears are still open, which means you have basically these gates that are made out of spiritual steel, and you can't break them down. If you want to break them down, you need acid. That acid is the tears of a Jew break down those doors and open up the gates of prayer. It comes out that since the Chorban, since the destruction of the Temple, the Chorban, if you want to fix things, the way to fix things is through the power of tears. The Chafetz Chaim says, it's why. One of the reasons why we need women to pray, because they're quicker to tears. And those tears are crucial to breaking down those barriers in heaven so that we can bring the final Geula. If you want your tefillahs to be answered, we need the power of tears. The Baal Shem Tov, the holy Baal Shem Tov, he had a custom that he always tried very hard to pray in a place that had a women's section. Those of you that know in Europe, I don't know what it was like back home, but um, in Europe, the women's sections were sometimes tiny. They were, the women didn't go to the synagogue except for, for Yom Kippur and, 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 and Rosh Hashanah. They rarely went to the shul, to the synagogue of the Bet Knesset. And the Baal Shem Tov wanted to daven in a place where he knew that there were women davening on the other side of the Mechitza. Why? Because he knew if they are davening, then there are tears going on. If there are tears, then that unleashes a certain power. And that power is what he wanted for his own prayers. It's a little bit of a tangent, but it's a story that's very beloved to me because very beloved to my rabbi, Rav Moshe Shapiro. Rav Moshe Shapiro tells over the story about his father as a child. And his father, this was during World War I. And there was a certain period during World War I, let's guess, it was 1917, when Jewish communities 
in certain areas of Russia, we're in tremendous, tremendous danger. So what happens? The Chafetz Chaim came out with the ruling and said, things don't look good. The Jewish people are in danger. We need to unleash our Navy SEALs. We need to unleash our big guns, the most powerful commanders that we have. And he made an announcement, empty out the synagogues and put the women in there. This is what he said. Put the women in. We need their tears. So my Rebbe said his father was a child. Ironically, he went into the, into the, into the women's section upstairs to watch down from the Ezrat Nashim to see what the women would do. So what do you think the women did? I'll tell you what I would think. A couple of years ago, I, I spoke in a very, very, very distinguished Torah community. And I spoke to the Neshe, to the ladies group over there, about the power of prayer. Before I spoke, there was a very famous Rebetzin. Her husband's one of the biggest Rosh Hashivas in the land. And she asked me to step out. She says, we're going to say a few parakim of Tehillim before you give your speech. So I'm kind of curious to see what goes on, how women say Tehillim in this prestigious community. So I, I make myself into like a wolf flower. I, I hide myself in the corner. And the Rebison gets up. And she does exactly what happens in the Mir Yeshiva where I learn in the mornings. He does exactly, you know, he, she gets up and she goes, Shiramala is mi mama kim krasicha Hashem. And all the ladies are going, tapa, 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 so it's like, it's like a rock concert, the whole thing, you know. It's like you think the whole place is going to collapse. Everyone's screaming, the ladies are quietly responding. It's a different generation. What was described just two generations ago, my Rebbe's father saw the women come in. Ding, 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 ding. The women are coming in. That's it. One of the women goes straight to the Arana Kodesh. He, she opens it up. Women are coming in with their children. And then all Gehenna was let loose. The women started screaming at God in Yiddish. Each one saying their own prayers. And there were tears and they were crying. And they were shaking their children in front of the Sifrei Torah. And they're saying, you got to save us. And these tears were coming out of their eyes. That's how our grandmothers used to pray. It was a whole different world back then. It was a natural outpouring of tears that people used to give over. I'm not saying that us men folk can't do it. Just that the Talmud already identifies that for women, that this powerful acid, this spiritual acid in heaven is something that they have as their birthright. So what is tears? What does it mean for us? And how can we come out of this class with something positive? Because this is not going to be a depressing class. This is going to be an uplifting class. So what I want to say is the following thing. I'm going to break down tears into three categories. Category number one, category number two, and category number three. One and three, we've already spoken about. But category number two, that is the point of tonight's class, is to explain properly category number two. What is category number one and category number three? Number one is called tears of tragedy, tears of tsar, tears that come out to quote the prophet Yermio in Eicha, Eini, Eini, Yardamai. My eyes, my eyes are a river of tears. In Eicha, in the Book of Lamentation, there's many references to tears. Tit, when there's a Chorban, the destruction of the temple. You see the terrible suffering of the people, the destruction of Hashem's holy home, the, the, the dispersion of Klai Yisrael to the four corners of the world. It creates tears. And these tears are tears of, um, of, of, of unbounded tragedy. Unbounded tragedy. There's no hope. We don't know what to do with, these, with ourselves. Now I'm going to interject now and answer my first two questions with the morale of Prague. Because Marala Prague has a lot to say about these tears. Without going on to the deeper dimension that we're going to learn in a few minutes. What does the Marala Prague say? 
A person goes through a tragedy and they cry and there's tears coming out of their eyes. There's many different ways Hashem could have created us. When we're upset, when we're going through difficult times, when we're going through sorrow, all kinds of things could happen. As I said before, and why isn't there like, I know, our foreheads could turn red. If it happened to everyone, if that was a symbol of pain, it's fine. Why tears and why coming out of our eyes? Says the Maharal, the external expression of tears is showing the internal expression what is happening with our souls, meaning the following thing. When we cry, so what happens? Our eyes are covered with liquid. Not regular liquid, this salty liquid, a salty liquid that causes our vision to become diffracted. So if you remember from 10th grade physics, when you're looking through a liquid, you no longer are looking at something. That's why there's no ayin hara on a fish, because you cannot see a fish in the water. Even if you see it, you're not really looking at it because of the laws of diffraction. So if your eyes are covered with liquid, so you no longer are looking properly, says the maral, this is exactly, exactly what's happening in your soul. Meaning, when something goes wrong, my father passed away a year ago. So we knew for many, many years that this day was going to come. But we're used to being with my father. We're used to having him alive. He was sick, but he was alive. So what does Hashem do? You have, in the Maral's language, you have what's called a tahalich. A, B, C, D. And we're used to what happens next. E, F, you suddenly X. Boom. Something completely unexpected happens. So this A, B, C, D, X creates this emotion called tears. We've been thrown out of our own comfort zone. We're no longer in control. We don't know what to do with ourselves. It's fascinating. But the same thing happens with tears of laughter. And tears of laughter is also when something so unusual, this extraordinary scene of a seven and eight-year-old girl with this huge, monstrous woman pattering it down, looking for a bomb. So for me, this was the funniest thing ever. You don't expect it. And this created this emotion called tears. This something came out of nowhere. So every single time that we externally tear is because internally we've lost our vision. When we internally tear, and then what comes out of our mouth is like groaning sounds. We can't speak properly. When a person's crying, they can no longer speak normally is because simultaneously, with your eyes closing up, your mouth is closing up, you are ceasing to function as a regular human being. That's what happens. You're now in a state where your life is, so to speak, momentarily closed. The shop has been closed. Everything has been switched off. That's what the morale says. The tears are tragedy. And also, we find the same thing with tears of joy. Those tears, at that moment then, Everything's been closed up. Internally, we have this state of deep confusion. It's fascinating. The morale at every single opportunity will always show us that the Hebrew language brings out exactly his idea. What's the Hebrew word for tears? Demaot. Demaot. Okay? Dema. Dalad mem ayin. Those of you familiar with Mishnaic Hebrew, Dema is one of the Hebrew words for confusion. So, Again, for the scholars over here, if you mix turuma, right, with, with, with chulen, and you mix it together, you don't know what the mixture is. The mixture is called dema, a confused mixture. Every single time you cry, you enter into the state of confusion. What's category number three? We're skipping to the third category. Is what we just mentioned, the tears of laughter. The Talmud brings down a beautiful Gemara in Sukkah, Nun Beis Amad Aleph, that says, at the end of days, Hashem is going to bring the Yetzirah. He's going to bring the evil inclination. And will present them in front of the Tzadikim and the Rishayim. The evil and the righteous. What will he do to the Yetzirah? Slaughter it. End of days. Goodbye. The evil inclination is now gone. <coughs> says the Gemara. The Gemara brings down that everyone is going to start crying. The tzaddikim are going to look at the Yitzhara and see this huge mountain. 
and the Rishayim will look at this Yetzara and see a, a tiny little hair. And the Tzadikim will look at the Yetzara and says, how do we do this? How do we conquer such an incredible mountain? They are going to be like the proverbial mountain climber that reaches the top of Everest. How do we do that? How do we manage to conquer something so huge? And these are tears of joy. These are two tears of, it's, of, of how in, incredible this feeling is that we manage to conquer this thing. And Nebuch, the Rashaim, they said, well, we, we were so stupid. This was all it was. And we could have had everything. And we gave it up for stupidity, for nothing. And those are tears, tears of tragedy that have no tikkun, that there's nothing you can do for them anymore. Interesting thing in the, um, in the power of the Hebrew language. We say, at the end of the days, the tzaddikim are going to look at a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and it says, Nagila v'nismecha bach. Right? We are going to rejoice and be happy bach. What does the word bach mean? The Sifrei Kaddish is the bach, is the same betchaf of the word bechi. The tears, the bach plus the letter yud. The yud symbolizes the shleimut, the, the completion at the end of days. So the bechi at the end of days is the bechi where the tears have brought us to this extreme closeness to Kaddish Baruch Hu, this extreme inner sense of shleimut, of completion. But that's not why I'm standing here tonight. That's not the purpose of my class. The purpose of my class is not to talk about category one, which is tears of tragedy, or category number three, which is tears of triumph at the end when everything comes together. I want to talk about category number two. And this was a revelation for me, and I'm sure many people in this room have never thought of this. I'm hoping you get the same thrill that I felt when I understood this year, I only discovered this idea this year, about category number two, I understood exactly what category, it's a new category. In about 15 minutes, we're gonna understand that this new category, on the deepest, deepest level, is actually the connection between one and three. It makes one and three turn one, but it is going to be a different category. And this is the main lesson, is to know that there is a new type of tears. There's a middle section of tears. What is this middle section? Is there any way to make it a little co cooler in here? Is it, is it like, <clears throat> just like it's possible? It's a little bit. <clears throat> There's a medrash. The medrash is brought down by Rabbeinu Bachya in Vayikra, Perak Beis, Pasa Gimel. And this Rabbeinu Bachya we talk about it a lot on the festival of Sukkot. It's a very, very powerful piece. But this Rabbeinu Bachya brings down the story of how tears began. I challenge anyone in this honorable audience. Ma parsha rishona Where does the story of tears begin? Where do we see tears for the first time? I'm not talking about the word tears in the Torah. I'm talking about in the Midrash, the idea of tears. So, you're 100% right, but in the Midrash, we already find tears on the second day of creation. All the way at the very beginning, what did God create on the second day of creation? He created water, and he split the water into what's called Maim El Yonim and Maim HaTachtonim, higher waters and lower waters. So, this separation of the higher waters and the lower waters says the Midrash, created what's called Mayim Bochim, waters crying. Who's crying? The lower waters. It's an interesting thing I mentioned before, and then when we cry, tears come out that are salty. Well, guess what? You go to the oceans, do not drink that water. That water is salty. That salty water is in the symbolism of the Midrash. You're looking at tears. These are tears. Why are they crying? What has gone wrong over here? What are the tears of the waters that are out there? The answer is they're crying because it's not fair. We want to be up there with Hashem. 
They are yearning for closeness with God. These tears come out of frustration that they have been locked into this prison called the lower worlds. And they started off, like all the other water, with the opportunity to be close to God, and they're down here. And the Medish brings down the waters are, are trying to surge upwards, but they cannot. They are straightjacked. They're going nowhere. What does Hashem say? Hashem says, you waters, you crybaby waters, waters of tears, you waters of the ocean, I'm going to reward you with two things. Number one, when the praising of God begins, you have to praise God first, and then the higher waters can praise Hashem. You will always come first. But much more than that, I'm going to give you a privilege that the higher waters can never enjoy. Your salt, which symbolizes your tears, are going to go where? On the Mizbech, the holiest place in the whole universe. And the water that comes from the lower planet, that comes from down here, that water is going to be used on Sukkot. Sukkot symbolizes the end of days. Sukkot symbolizes when everything becomes reconciled. That water comes from the Maim HaTachtonim, from the lower waters. Okay, let's step back and understand what happened over here. We're being introduced to the tears for the first time. The tears begin with frustration. The tears begin with the lower waters being locked in, being closed in. They don't know what to do with themselves. Hashem says, because you're crying, because you want to get close to me, well, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that you will end up, in a deeper sense, even higher than the higher waters. Let me translate that into the language of this class. This in-between category of tears are tears that the helplessness is the helplessness of wanting to become closer to God and you become frustrated. <coughs> and those tears create a new reality. Those tears create a new world where Kodesh Baruch Hu shifts and adjusts the laws of the game and he introduces new laws and new mitzvot and says, you waters that are down there at the bottom are going to reach higher than the higher waters. You're going to reach the highest of the highest. Let me translate that to you in even simple English. This type of tears opens up a deeper and more profound reality. This deeper and more profound reality creates the solution that brings us to the tears of joys. You hear this? Again, that moment when you feel vulnerable, that moment when you recognize that all is lost, that you're not in control, that moment when your body has closed up, and remember, we learn together, that every time you cry, you, you, you become dysfunctional. Your eyes close, your mouth close. At that point then, you are going back into the womb and you're coming back out more powerful and closer to God than ever before. Those tears have created this new reality. And in that new reality, the tears turn into the tears of joy. I cannot begin to tell you how deep this idea is. And once I've shown this to you, we can understand a whole bunch of things. Let me give you some examples. Through the examples, we can understand this a little bit better. One of the Rishonim that lived in Germany was called the Rokeach. It had nothing to do with bells of Hasidus or a form of horseradish. Rokeach was one of the Rishonim, and he brings down that on Sukkot, people used to come, contrary to the imagery that you and I think, Simchat Beit HaShavah was a party man, right? Everyone was dancing and singing. It was great. They used to come and they used to cry for rain. And when they used to cry for rain, with those tears, they used to feel the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that was there at the Simchat Beit HaShavah, and it would turn into this exalted state of happiness and joyfulness. Because on Sukkot, the tears for rain, the tears that say, God, we cannot survive without your help. That 
creates a new reality of extreme closeness to Hashem. That's the Simchat Beit HaShoah, Misham Shoavim Ruach HaKodesh. You can feel that closeness of Hashem, like I mentioned before, and Sukkot is a taste of the world to come. The Taz, in Orachim Simon Reish Peiches, Sifkot and Kaf, brings down something incredible. Who was the one man in history that was always closest to the end of days? We normally associate him with laughter. There's a person that was always focused, Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, whenever he saw a difficult scenario, people were crying, he was always laughing. So the Taz brings down that Rabbi Akiva, he used to cry on Shabbos. Now, it's forbidden to cry on Shabbos. But his tears were actually the tears that allow the tears of sadness to connect to the tears of laugh at the end of days. His tears, so to speak, create a new reality that brings us to the end of days, which brings us full circle, which brings us to me and you, you and I. You and I, our tears, when do we see these tears that create a new reality? Not when we're crying for a loved one, <clears throat> not when we're, we're crying from tragedies, but rather those tears come out in the power of prayer. We pray to God and we cry and we cry, we feel vulnerable. We, we feel like the morale says locked in, closed up, incapable of expressing ourselves. At that point then, a new reality opens up. Those tears of the acid that break down those metal walls between us and God and takes us right in. But once we're right in, Hashem invokes the power that is, that is infinite and changes everything and fixes everything and brings the Geula. So you have over here, and again, I don't understand exactly how this works. I wish I did. But we have over here that category number one is the tears of tragedy, and category number three is the tears of joy at the end of the story when everything works out. But somehow, these tears that we, for example, do when we pray, somehow connect one to three. Somehow, in the same way that Tisha B'Av is always, always, always the same night as Pesach, and the tears that come out of our eyes on Tisha B'Av night are intimately connected to the tears of joy that come out as we come out of Egypt. What connects it is that the Jewish people feel the sense of, we're not in control. Well, if we're not in control, so who is? Hashem. When you recognize that, you unleash this new mahalach, this new power, so the Maim Tachtonim end at the top of the top of the top of the top. And that's what happens to the Jewish people. Yesterday, I had an incredible thought. I hope that the Rav agrees with this, because I'm saying this now for the first time, and I have no idea if this is true. But my heart tells me this is true. You mentioned beforehand a woman called Leah. And I have a soft spot for Leah, besides the fact she's my nine-year-old daughter, who I'm unabashedly obsessed with in a very healthy way. Uh, I love my little girly. And uh, I, all the Leahs I know are incredible people. Any Leahs in this room, just by chance? So I can dedicate the next few minutes to you. But uh, I always feel that Leah gets a bad deal in the pantheon of great Jewish women for a very simple reason. Every Rosh Hashanah, we talk about the big four. Who are the big four? Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Chana. Why Sarah and Chana? Because they're the ones that couldn't have children. Nebuch, the ones that suffered. Ah, Leah. She was like, you know, Haredi from Harnoff. Maybe <laughs> NRR. Yeah, six kids, like boom, boom, boom. Leah had it all. Yeah, as many kids as she wanted. Hello. Did you ever read the Ramban at the beginning of Parshas Vayetze? Leah was not ugly. Contrary to what people think, everyone thinks, oh, Leah, she was hideous. She was not. The Ramban says she was not hideous. Leah was beautiful, like all the Imams. Every tzaddikah was beautiful. It's just when you saw Leah, 
he was so distracted by her eyes because she used to cry herself to sleep every single night until all the hair around her eyes was flushed down. All you saw was like these red blotches. Her eyes were shocking. And, 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 and that was the first thing you noticed, is his eyes, his terrifying eyes. And they came from tears and tears and tears and tears because she was supposed to marry Esav. Esav, the most evil creature that ever walked on this planet. That was the natural zivug. So what happened to those tears? So we all know that those tears created a new reality. The new reality is that Esav rejected his whole role in making the world into a perfect place. Yaakov takes on Esav's role. Yaakov, when he buys the firstborn, the, first, the, the birthright from Esav, he takes on Esav's role. At that point then, Yaakov needs a new zivug. He needs a new partner. So Leah's tears create this new partner. But that's not me speaking. This is reading the Chumash. What I want to say is that the rabbis tell us that those ugly eyes that Leah created out of tears, she was rewarded by having a child called David Melech. We don't know anything about David Melech except for two things. He was a redhead. Go redheads. And he had beautiful eyes. He had, I, I did not know that. He had, be- okay, he had beautiful eyes. He had beautiful eyes. So everyone said, oh, that's so beautiful. Lay out ugly eyes. So she got a child with beautiful eyes. No, that's not the pshat over here. David HaMelech contains inside of him the Melech HaMashiach. He is, as the Rambam said, he's the first Mashiach. And then there'll be the last Mashiach. In other words, through those tears of Leah, David HaMelech was, so to speak, created. There would be a, a reconciliation that would bring the whole world back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That moment when Leah lives in this world, this hopeless world, where she's married, going to be married to a monster and spend the rest of her life in this devastating situation, creates a Dovod Melch who's going to be metakin and is going to fix absolutely everything. So let me summarize. What I came to teach today, before I give my final message, my final message is basically chizuk, to strengthen all of us, to be able to face the challenges in front of us. What I'm teaching tonight is, is that we're all pretty familiar, unfortunately, with tears of tragedy and hopefully with tears of joy. What we learned today is that there's actually a process that connects them. For you and for I, we find this in our prayers more than anything else. But those are moments when we feel hopeless and we feel not in control and we feel exactly like the Mayim Bochim, like those lower waters, those useless lower waters who have been disconnected from God. But what happens? Those tears create a new reality. Hashem says, okay, after you have cried, I'm going to change the rules of how this world is run, and you're going to end up the highest of the highest of the highest. The question is, I don't want anyone to leave this room miserable. I don't want anyone to leave this room and say, okay, so he wants us to, to recognize that we are in a state of lack of control. And, and, and somehow, this, I know, it, just seems, it seems very hard. And there are so many people in this room that are going through real difficulties. Hashem keeps us close. When Hashem keeps us close, He always gives us opportunities to turn to Him. Every person in this room has known a little taste of what it's like to be Leah, to feel trapped, to feel they don't know where their lives are going. And every person in this room, because that's why you come and learn Torah, knows that there's an address and there's someone to talk to. And somehow, or rather, we don't always get to see it, those tears catapult us into a new reality. And that new reality can bring us to the tears of joy. So I want to come full circle. I began by mentioning, and now at the very end of my year of Avelut, of mourning for my father. And an interesting thing, uh, there are people in this room from my generation, meaning that my father 
was a young man during the Holocaust. And he didn't speak, not because he suffered. He actually did not suffer so much. He didn't speak because he came from a generation that people did not talk about themselves. It came out of, out of a deep sense of modesty. Well, just it, it wasn't his shtick. He didn't talk about his exploits. It took me forever to find out about what he did. Uh, he fought in two wars for Israel in 1948 and 1956. What I did not know is that in between, he was working for the Mossad. It just came out by chance. Afterwards, I found out that while I was growing up in London in the 70s, he was secretly doing all the stuff for the Soviet Union to try and help Jews. I did not know these things. These things came out very, very recently. During the shiva for my father, my father's cousins told me about what he did during the war. And I always knew a little bit, but I didn't understand. He had a whole uh, organization with his brothers for saving Jews. And interesting, uh, uh, there's a book about um, how the Baba Barabba survived the war through a whole bunch of miracles. And my father, not mentioned by name, but his family is mentioned as one of the people that saved him in his hometown of Arad, which is in Romania. So I decided, OK, this is ridiculous. I had to wait for my father to pass away to get to know about his life. I decided this year I'm going to find every book I can that talks about Romania during the war. And I realized I did not know. And again, for those of you that still have parents and grandparents from that age group, I don't know how to say this. In, in Yiddish, we say chaperain. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Grab your, these people are, 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 are unique. So get them to talk to you, to tell us about that, those ages. There's one fellow who wrote a book. His name was Meir Kahan, or Meir Kahan. And Meir Kahan grew up in the same village that my father grew up, Vishov. And I was so excited to read this book because it just starts to be describing this little town that my father grew up. And I meet a person, don't know him personally, by chance, his son went to me, his son Mendy went with me to Yeshiva. He's from Antwerp, he lived in Antwerp, and I knew his son. But this person over here is describing, and it's fascinating, but I'm going to be very honest with you. The first half of the book was kind of generic. In the Holocaust books, then you have a, you always start off by showing how beautiful everything was and how they used to live, and then everything turns into Gehenna. And they all die, except for these people who miraculously escape. That's your classic generic Holocaust book. Sorry for being cynical. I believe you should read them because these stories give us a lot of chizuk, a lot, they, they strengthen us. This book was different. This book was different because, first of all, it had the strangest title. The title was called Between My Father and the Old Fool. So when you see this title, you say, this is weird. Between My Father and the Old Fool. Little did I know that the title was describing a scene in the middle of the book, which for me is one of the most powerful scenes that I've ever read, because at that point then, Meir Kahan, Amir Kahan became you and I. And he talks about himself as a person who clearly had a lot of simchat chayim, love of life, joie de vivre. He was always a positive looking person. And apparently, as we're gonna see from the story, he must be very good looking, his son, for sure, was a very handsome young man. I remember very clearly from my yeshiva days. And he's part of a Hungarian battalion, a Jewish Hungarian battalion. Comes May 1944. The Hungarian government is disbanded. The Arab Cross, Hungarian fascists, which were basically Nazis with a Hungarian accent, they took over. With a couple of months, they managed to send hundreds of thousands of Yidden to Auschwitz. What happened to this Jewish Hungarian battalion? They were forced to march to Germany, where they would be given over to the Germans. And they didn't know it in the end, but their story was going to end in Bergen-Belsen in the concentration camp. And he's marching. And Meyer knows that once he's going to be given over to the Germans, 99% he's going to die. Why? Because he already knew from the stories of what was going on till then. He knew about Auschwitz. He had heard all the stories about what was happening. And he was no fool. And the day before, they are going to be handed over to the Germans. 
They're sleeping in a farmhouse on the Hungarian side of the Hungarian-German border. And the farmers are taking care of these young Hungarian soldiers who happen to be Jews. And there was young, a young woman, and her name was Marushka. Marushka, this Hungarian woman, sees Meyer and brings him milk. Okay, he didn't want to take it from her. And she says, come on, you know you need this. Okay, so he took it. He tried to pay. He wouldn't take the money. And it's very clear that she's attracted to him. And this is written by Art Scroll. So luckily, the Rabbi, Rabbi Reinman from Lakewood, who translated it from the Yiddish, he wrote this in an incredibly clever way. So it's very clear what is happening over here. It's very, very clear that she has her eyes on him. And then she comes to him and gives him a key and says, look, behind the horse stables, there's a, a room of supplies. We use it for the winter. But now it's summer. No one goes in there. This is the key to that room. You go in there. There's food there. And I'll bring you stuff every day. Even my parents aren't going to know. In a couple of months, the war was over. This was after Stalingrad. This was a few weeks before the invasion, before D-Day. So here's this key. And this key is the key to life. All he's got to do is he has to go and unlock this room and go in there and hide. No one's going to find him. No one's going to notice he's gone. Just a couple of months, he can leave and go out and relive his life. But he understands that there's a price for this freedom that this Marushka is going to want more than just to bring him cups of milk. So as he's going to this place, a picture of his father comes in front of him. His father is in the title, Between My Father and the Old Fool. And his father looks at him in this vision, exactly like Yaakov Avinu in the story of Yosef and Potiphar's wife. And says to him, Mayor, are you, don't you remember that you're a yeshiva bachar? What, you don't know what this woman wants from you? You don't understand what's happening over here? Where's your secha? Where's your brains? He says, you, you, the Jewish boy does not do this. Go out and meet your fate. Then another voice comes. Who's this other voice? The old fool. The old fool is a reference to Shlomo Melch in Keheles. The Melech Zakein Viksil is the Yitzhahara. Yitzhahara says, he says, Mayor, he says, it's pekuach nefesh. You have to take care of yourself. What's the big deal? You can withhold temptation. You can be strong enough. What's the big deal? It's just a couple of months and you'll be free. You got to take care of yourself. Go, grab the opportunity. This is going back and forth. And he's standing there in front of the door. In the middle of the night, they're in. Hungarian side of the Hungarian-German border, a couple of few hours before he has to be handed over. And he's going back and forth. And then he finds this inner strength. And he throws the key into a ditch, and he runs back to where all his friends are sleeping. And after that, literally all hell is let loose. Before he knows it, he's stripped naked, Everything he has, his tefillin, his money, his everything that he was carrying with him is taken away from him. Shmatas are put on him. He's had his first beating because he walked too slowly at one point. And he's lying there in his bed in the bunker in a concentration camp. And this voice comes to him. Man, look how stupid you look now. Look at you. You're nothing. You're just a number. You could have been with Marishka now. She would have taken care of you. And, and this voice keeps on coming back as each chapter gets worse and worse and worse. In the next chapter, there's one scene where he barters the little bread that he has, he barters it for a pair of tefillin. Him and three friends, they put their bread together and there's a whole business going on by the latrines. This was well known. The latrines, the people that had access to the, to the supplies that were taken from the prisoners. They would buy it, they would sell it for bread. And he got himself a pair of tefillin. And he goes to his bed, and he hides under the, this little teeny blanket, and he tries to put the tefillin on. And suddenly the, the blanket is open wide, and there's that capo with a whip. 
and he takes the tefillah and he crushes it under his feet and starts whipping him until he's a whisper away from his death. The voice comes back, Meyer, look at yourself now. You could have been safe. Marishka would have taken care. You could have been drinking milk. And he sees his best friend. Again, this is not why you came to hear a Holocaust story. You know what it means to, be, to see a friend being eaten by a dog. <coughs> Until eventually, there's nothing left of him. Until the Americans liberate Bergen-Belsen. He's lost everything. Every single friend he ever had. His mother, his father, his brothers, his sisters, his aunts, his uncles. People that had taken care of him when he was in Budapest. There was one chap. All gone. Everything gone. And then, from the ashes, he rebuilt his life. And he ends up living in Antwerp. And the story ends. And I'm thinking to myself, how does he do it? How, how did he manage to stay strong? How did he manage to conquer that voice that kept him coming to him? And then there's this epilogue. And this epilogue is so powerful. The epilogue fast forwards to the 1970s. And Mayor Kahan is dedicating a Sefer Torah in a vision sashtibel in, in B'nai Brak. And he's there with his wife and children. And they're dancing with a Sefer Torah. There's a moment of celebration. But this Sefer Torah is no ordinary Sefer Torah. It's being dedicated in memory of all the people that he lost. And the voice comes back to him one last time. That's what he writes. And the old fool says, man, why are you dancing? You lost everything. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, your grandparents. Everyone was murdered. What are you dancing for? This is not a time to dance. It's a time to cry. And this is how the book ends. And this is the message that I want to share with you. Because this is the key to everything. This is the key of how we Jews survive. The book ends with the following sentence. To that point, I turned to the evil inclination, to the old fool. And I said to him for the last time, he said, life is always a choice between anger and joy. And I choose joy. That's it. Finished. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean to go through Gehenna and choose joy? This is the secret of the Jewish people. It's something that you and I Deep down, we understand that somehow our faith, somehow our knowledge that a Baruch Hu is there for us means that we can be the Mayim Baichin in our own lives. We can be the rejected Mayim Baichin from the second day of creation. But somehow, we choose joy. And we choose joy. And with that, choosing joy, we know that somehow we're going to end up like the Mayim Baichin at the highest of the highest of the highest of the highest. We know that. And this is something that is the power of the Jew. Because if we don't choose joy, we get depressed. We, get, we, get, we, just, we just turn and we close into ourselves. And that's it. And that's it. And our lives become this horrible, vicious cycle of darkness. But a Jew chooses joy. And therefore, whenever we have these challenges, so we cry and we cry to Kodesh Baruch Hu. But in those tears, in the middle of the Shemun Asri, when you're at Kish Baruch for all the tsars that we have, there's this joy. There's this joy that somehow, with the Kish Baruch Hu, you know that this story somehow, and we have no idea how because we're completely closed up, is going to end up over there with that Oz Yemali Shaykh Pina, where the tears are going to be banished forever. How beautiful is it <coughs> that the Word Bechi, base Chaf Yud, is the same gematria. And those of you who are not mathematical, it's too late for you. This is even I can do this. Bet is two, Kaf is twenty, right? Yud is ten, it's thirty-two. Same gematria is Kavod. Kavod, honoring Hashem. And this is something incredible, because the tears of a Jew that come with this joy, that somehow or rather Kodesh Baruch Hu is going to work things out for us. We throw ourselves into his hands is the greatest kavod that we give to Hashem. And with this, we have the secret of Jewish survival. 
And with this, we have the secret about how every person in this room deep down knows that our stories, whatever we're going through, is going to end up. How does it say in Disneyland? And they all lived happily ever after. Except in Disneyland, it's whatever it is, until they have to go for divorce therapy. <laughs> but for us, it ends up with the tears as we see this mountain in front of us. And we ask ourselves, how did we conquer this mountain? How do we manage? And the answer is, because throughout our lives and throughout the challenges, we know we have a choice. We know we can choose anger and bitterness. But, and with this I conclude, it's the power in our little secret that whatever we go through, we always, always choose joy. And that joy is what brings us to the tears of laughter, may we be zocha, to enjoy those beautiful tears, Meher Thank you for listening.